Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Hey, Facebook Live, how are you doing today? Hope you are doing well. Uh, it is time for the best of the week. I am rocking and rolling here. I am so incredibly blessed to have interviewed the people that I was able to interview this week, and I am absolutely stoked about it, and I want to tell you about it. And uh, as you see the that that way now, uh, the uh, little timer is going to keep me honest here. I am actually still in recovery mode <laughs> from interviewing. Uh, ended up being 13 interviews and uh, 10 on Thursday, and th uh, I believe uh, three or four, well, nine, nine and four. Well, my math is even off a little bit, but uh, it was just unbelievable. I'm going to go in reverse order, and we're going to just jump right into it because we'll make this nice and shorter and sweeter, even though we have so many amazing people to get through. So uh, I'm going to go in reverse order because uh, that's going to help my memory a little bit. So Philippe Noel is a student at, uh, at Harvard, and I was able to talk with him last, but in no way least, because I got so jazzed about this. All right, Generation X out there, you know, baby boomers, it's 1985. There's this little thing called the flux capacitor and a DeLorean, and Michael J. Fox, and 1.21 gigawatts. What could I be talking about? Yeah, you know, Back to the Future. And at the end of Back to the Future, there's this little moment where Doc comes flying in in a flying DeLorean. It's uh, souped up even more. It's not just a time machine. It's a flying car. And it's not even just a flying car that's a time machine, but the car eats Marty McFly's trash and bio waste and he dumps all the little trash you know looks like a mad scientist doc dumps all the trash and all the food waste into the car and then takes off and goes back to the future again philippe noel is working on technology he has figured out how to do this okay <laughs> he has figured out how to do this and he is putting all the pieces together he's starting to put his team together and i mean it's a thing it's a thing so i mean it was back to the future day about two years ago was like 20 years into the future that that they can then that there was back to the future day and all of that stuff but uh, i mean he's figured out the technology so i was a little extra hyperactive even though it was the the the, the final interview of the week i was the most stoked and bouncing off the walls for that interview you've got to check it out and that that was his uh tedx harvard talk was all about how i forget the name of the technology but it's a thing and it's got a name and it's for for real and uh, awesome. So um, before that, uh, this was an amazing day yesterday because I had the privilege of talking to two survivors of paralysis who made the quality decision to live again, not just to survive and to breathe and, and basically exist, but they gave a quality decision. They made a decision to live without bitterness and without, you know, asking why, 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 and instead they chose to see their challenge, you know, as a gift. And so it was amazing. Marcus Aurelius Anderson, uh, uh, former Army uh, soldier, woke up. Uh, he talks about this in his TEDx talk. Uh, at the age of 40, he was broke. He was divorced. He was debilitated, and he was paralyzed on his back. And he spent... Uh, three months in that state, in a state of extreme bitterness. So uh, part of the things that I learned from him is he, he isn't, you know, he wasn't a saint. He wasn't an angel. It wasn't just like that. But his judo training, his karate training that, that teaches you to use the resistance as uh, to your advantage and to not wrestle with with a force that's stronger than you, but instead to use that power and to pivot your response to use it for your benefit and he started adopting that philosophy and he had a heart change and he had a change uh, of gratitude and he started really seeing adversity as a gift and man i, I just i mean i i talked to some of these people on be the talk and it's just so amazing uh marcus aurelius anderson um 
man, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Learned so much from you. You guys are going to want to watch not just the, the podcast when it drops in a few weeks, but you can actually watch many of these Facebook Lives. So they're up now, and I would encourage you to share these to get the message out. Now, I'm going to skip over the one before because uh, Willem Philipson uh, came in. He stayed up late last night because he's in the Netherlands, and um, he's six hours ahead. So he it was late uh, Friday night. He stayed up. Very similar story to Marcus Anderson. Uh, Willem uh, had a stroke at the age of 23, and he was a rock guitarist he toured he was a rock and roll guitar uh was a jukebox hero is is you know not the name of his song but that's if you remember that cheesy 70s song he was a real live jukebox hero with you know with one guitar is is how that song went and and that you know that's what he was doing 23 years old stroke massive stroke debilitates a big part of his brain leaves his uh right side i believe paralyzed and he had to relearn how to do everything. Very similar situation as Marcus Aurelius Anderson, flat on his back, you know, having a hard time. And he chose to see life differently because when we change the way that we look at things, the things that we look at are going to change. And that's what he he started. Uh, he started uh, learning how to do everything all over again. And the thing that gave him the most life was when he set a quality goal an amazing goal to swim in a group swim. It was a 3K swim in the Netherlands, in the river. And he trained and he trained and he trained for a year and a half, and he was able to successfully complete the 3K swim. And when he did complete the 3K swim, all the other people that finished ahead of them because they had working four working limbs – they all jumped back in the water. I didn't know this from his talk. So this was some fresh stuff in the inter- they all, I'm The spoiler alert, they jumped back in the water. And he had, a, a, what I realized, is he had a transformation effect, not just in his life, but for all of them as well. And then he did even more things. I'm not going to spoil that. You're going to have to listen to that interview, which is also on Facebook Live. And you can share it. That's got over, this is amazing. He's got... Uh, several people sharing that, and that has over 1,000 views. And I talked with him about 24 hours ago. We did the Facebook Live. A little over 24 hours ago, it's got over 1,000 views on Facebook already. Uh, really incredible stuff. Um, in between those two, we talked about boundaries with Siri Gilman. She is a psychotherapist. Her TEDx talk about boundaries is about well it's i'm sure it's over the 270,000 listen mark or view mark right now so it's a very well crafted uh talk on boundaries and she's even written books on boundaries as well as pet uh uh interest of mine um uh industry of mine uh as you know uh for the healthcare system so we talked a lot about boundaries for people working in the healthcare system because they need boundaries because there are no boundaries because there's no margin at all. If you're in healthcare, people are dying and there's no margin and you might do everything right and they can still, you know, die or bad things can still happen when you do everything right. And you know what? We're all human and we're not really allowed to admit this. So we don't always do everything right. And uh, we talked about some of those issues. We talked about those in boundaries with Sari Gilman. Guess what? That's also Facebook Live, and you can go right here on the page and uh, and scroll down and find it and watch it and share it. If there's somebody in your life that might not even be you that needs some boundaries, you can share it. Okay? Uh, then we had, oh, those were the four yesterday that I had. Okay? So four. And then I guess that means I had 10. I had 10 on Thursday. So yesterday I was all, I was a little bit uh, reeling from doing a, a record, a personal best of 10 interviews on Thursday. Um, we ended the day on Thursday with uh, Dr. Edwin Edibiri. Uh He is uh, Dr. Happiness. He's Mr. Happiness. I don't know if he has a doctorate or an MBA or, or what it is. I think he might have a doctorate. Uh, he is Mr. Happiness. He's the chief happiness officer. This is the man that interviewed over 1,000 people on the subject of happiness. So he developed a, um, 
a protocol, and he developed a real systematic way of uh, developing and identifying the behaviors and actions that can actually make happiness a learned skill. A skill is something that you can teach someone. You can actually learn a skill as opposed to a talent or as opposed to something else. But a skill is something that you can train someone. Dr. Edwin Edebiri, I'm going to call him the doctor because he's interviewed a lot more people than I have. He's interviewed over a thousand people on happiness. So that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to honorary, you know, Facebook live, be the talk doctorate to uh, Edwin Edebiri here because I said so and it's my show. <laughs> he interviewed a thousand people and he identified behaviors that you can watch on his talk. We talked a little bit about that. We talked about some other things in the interview. It is just absolutely amazing, and uh, what a great guy. Now, he, offline, I was kind of, I was a little tired, so I was talking to him about how, you know, sometimes my equipment acts up and all this, and he was like, you know, hey, Nathan, um, you, if you want to be happy, you gotta you gotta flow with it. You gotta be a little flexible. Now, many of you have heard that before. Many of you that that were with me uh, training in Guatemala, or I was with you, and we were with our friend John Maxwell, frankly, doing making history because this has never happened before. An entire country uh, changed and transformed. Uh, you know that I learned how to be flexible. I thought, but I'm still learning. And uh, Mr. Happiness, okay, Dr. Happiness offline was was kind of coaching me a little bit. You know what? I'm coachable. I'm teachable. I want to be happy. I want you to be happy. Before that, this was uh, very similar to happiness. We had uh, Farzana Jiraj, and Farzana uh, basically did a very application-heavy, mindful talk uh, to uh, TEDx Stanley Park, which is the largest uh, TEDx, certainly, I believe, in Canada, if not beyond. I mean, I, I'm starting to talk to many people, and, and, and there's a little bit of uh, difference of opinion as to what is the number one largest TEDx outside of TED, and I'm hearing different ones, and I don't really, you know, I, I'm, I'm good to go. Whoever I talk to last, <laughs> and there are thousands of people at these events, so I mean, it's it's really amazing. She was brought out second to last, okay, so she's batting almost clean up, and they wanted her to do like this mindfulness exercise, but some of the, the, the coaches didn't know what she was doing, and so she had the challenge of not just having the, the bright lights hitting her and ha having to be mindful and calm herself down, but her whole talk was getting the audience to not just breathe and not just be physically relaxed, but they had to be emotionally engaged and also in the process in order to really be alert for that final speech. And so I got to talk with her. It was very similar to when I have a MC on Be The Talk podcast. And I've had, uh, I, I think, at least one MC, and we're talking about a different, you know, this invisible, uh, you know, you might think it's a little woo-woo, but it's a real thing. You know, if you are a speaker and you don't think that reading the room is a thing or the energy level of the room is a thing, uh, you are going to be headed for some real awkward uh, speaking engagements. If you don't think that's a, th a thing and find your own way to uh, measure and gauge and adapt and pull up the energy in the room. So we talked a lot about some of those intangibles and uh, Farzana was, was awesome just because we had a little bit of hard time connecting and she was so darn flexible and patient and I was I was getting a little bit box card in uh, with the schedule that day and um, and I really appreciate her flexibility and it's a really great uh, talk that's coming out in a few weeks. Before that, we talked to uh, a friend of mine, uh, David McGlennon. We talked about how he uh, helped his father in the insurance industry um, grow and scale a seven-figure business and then sell that business. And then he turned around a few years later, and he did that for a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, someone I know from back in my Cleveland days about 20 years ago who went on and uh, formed a, a just absolutely award-winning wellness company. Uh, and I'll, heck, I'll, I'll name drop it, uh, Bravo Wellness in, in the wellness space, just award-winning there in the Cleveland area. And, and uh, David was a guy that, that in the early days was, was a key guy in scaling up that sales team. And how does he do it? It's because of culture. And I had brought David in 
a few years ago to my Live to Lead Brandywine event in Wilmington, Delaware, and he shared with us the eight keys to creating a high-performing culture. It was just amazing. And so my interview with David, which is also on Facebook Live that you can see, we touched about all those different touch points. It was just uh, really fun to have him uh, on the talk. And uh, before that, we had uh, Anna Dolce. Anna Dolce is a hospitality expert. She is a award-winning, uh, you know, we didn't really talk about this, but award-winning beauty queen, uh, Miss Georgia, not the state, even though Georgia is known for Southern hospitality. Uh, as long as you're away from that big metro area, I'm just kidding. A little bit, I married an Atlanta, Atlanta uh, gal, so love Atlanta, but sometimes things are a little busier there. And that was Anna's uh, uh, beef with the hospitality industry. It's not very hospitable. So she has found many times the higher end she goes to a really upscale place that has really wonderful food and it's very forward thinking and it's, you know, fusion and all, all these things. It's very pricey, but she walks in and she, you know, you get this vibe sometimes and she's sensitive to the vibe. Instead of being welcomed and embraced and, uh, and, and, and served, you feel processed and you feel herded and you feel, uh, assimilated instead of welcomed and embraced and served. And so, um, you know, really fun conversation and it has relevance to anything that you are doing, whatever industry you are in the only way to differentiate yourself is not to be smarter than the next person anymore it's to have emotional intelligence and it's not even that it's not only just be aware of your own emotions and aware of other emotions and what's appropriate and how do you go to the extra mile it's about really welcoming people and having that extra service i mean chick-fil-a we didn't talk about chick-fil-a but that's why a lot of people love chick-fil-a because they really make you feel it's a it's a you know, $6, $7 chicken club sandwich, you know, for Pete's sake. And they make you, I mean, it's like an up, it's a top notch service experience, uh, to the point where, you know, I, I think you remember the controversy, whichever, you know, side of, you know, that, that contra, whatever your views are, um, you know, we're, we're here for all views, but there was a real controversy several years ago and there were protesters at Chick-fil-A and all that. It was because of their superior, not just the food. It was because they value everyone there. It was because they just make you feel great. They're not, you know, and, and so that we didn't talk about that specifically, but that's the idea that we talked about in my interview with Anna Dolce. It's about hospitality and uh, you're going to want to check out her talk because she really, I mean, really good sound bites, okay? At, you know, Taya was the other guy that had killer sound bites on Thursday. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm going to jump right over to him. So Anna had killer sound bites in her talk. I mean, just really a sound bite, something that, that you can remember the first time you hear it that just just reframes everything. Taya Roxon was uh, is is the son of a diplomat and we were talking about one of his i believe three tedx talks i believe anna also gave two or uh a possibly three tedx talks as well so i mean there's something about when you give multiple tedx talk i've only given one okay uh and i got pretty good at the sound bites for for the one that i did but imagine doing three i think tayo did three inside of a year so <laughs> it was just so succinct everywhere around and uh, he was talking about, you know, diplomacy and how to find common ground very quickly with people, regardless of your personal views and beliefs and, and all of that. How do you, what do you do if you're in Tayo's situation, you're, you know, a Nigerian uh, who is in a different French-speaking country outside of Nigeria, and if I'm remembering it, and I, I should know, you know, what the, I should know this, and offhand, I, I don't remember geopolitically, but he was in a, a grow, grew up, he was born in Nigeria, he grew up in a French-speaking country, and he was also, as he says, going through puberty, and so he was way out of his element, and he had to find common ground, he had to make friends, his dad's a diplomat, he had to be able to mingle, you know, uh, and I can relate. Um, so I shared in the interview, I asked him some questions because I need to also come to grips with the way that I was raised. I was raised in a very advantaged situation in the midst of a very rural farming kind of community. And yet, you know, my family was was uh, a very professional 
family, and I didn't know how to deal with that. And we didn't have the word that we use, you know, privileged and, you know, classism and, and uh, you know, uh, pri- you know, white privilege or, or, or uh, income privilege or any. We didn't have this 40 years ago when I was starting to grow up. And so I'm wrestling with, with these feelings of how, you know, you know uh, uh, all of that. So anyway, if you listen to the interview, Tayo helped me make a little bit of sense out of all that. Try not to overly uh, make this about me, but, he, but it, was, it was really, really helpful. And if you've ever thought about some of those things, I think it'll help you too as well. And, oh, just just turns out that Tayo was right before Anna, so I'm actually right on track right here. Uh, Nalini uh, Krishnan Kuti was before that. We were talking immigration. Now, she uh, gave a great Penn State University talk. Uh, it was TEDx Penn State University, and it was all about immigration. It was about, you know, it, this was a, a really, <clears throat> folks, I mean, no matter where you stand, on the immigration and, you know, all, all of the different facets of it. I would hope that every single person could agree. Okay. I, I think this is the most bread and butter. I mean, and I mean that in a good way. Non controversial. I mean, if you don't understand that America is a melting pot or some people call it a salad where we're all distinctive, if you don't understand that the best and brightest of the world come to America and then build the brands that America loves. <laughs> These American brands like Levi's and Heinz Ketchup and Google. You know, uh, Sergey Brin was an immigrant, okay? First generation. All of these great, you know, Elon Musk, self-driving cars, the Hyperloop, you know, all of this stuff, uh, things that are going on, okay? Um, it, it, you know, if you can't celebrate that, then this probably, I want to be open to everybody, but I, I'm, I'm only going to be uh, able to serve those that, that have an open awareness. I can't serve... If you have a fixed mind, if you have a convinced mind, a self-convinced mind, and you're not open to other perspectives and just suspending what you believe to consider somebody else's story and perspective, then you're probably not going to be too happy with this podcast. So this is about as non-controversial, not that that's what we're go- going for all the time, but it's just so apparent. Okay, that we can celebrate all these great things that the best in the world, they don't go uh, only to Canada. They don't only go to other countries. They don't only go to Europe, but they come largely to the United States of America. It still has that magnetism. And no matter what you feel about the the times that we're in, I was in, you know, where I was talking about Atlanta a few minutes ago. I was in Atlanta last week. Uh, with my mentor and then hanging out with uh, with my in-laws and my family. And it was primary season for the, the governor races, and it was a little interesting down there. And I'm, I'm not the most left-wing guy in the world. I'm probably not even, you know, all that middle of the road. I'm probably a little bit more in my older age. I'm, I'm you know, this may surprise you a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly traditionalist, but I try to be a very open mind. I, I'm not a convinced mind that is just going to fight you on everything. I'm going to listen to you first. And I'm going to try to be as tolerant and open as I can. So that said, I'm watching these elections in Georgia, these these uh, videos, and it's like, they're, they're interesting. I mean, there were there was open brandishment of firearms in many of these. these and it was like, I you know, I... That's that's a sensitive issue, and I'm seeing so many from that side of the spectrum that it's I'm feeling the push over to I'm like this is this something about this is is not okay. Even though you know I may actually support or I may not support, and I may or may not tell you which way I am. But I just it's funny how you see a whole bunch of you know ads from. Have you ever been in that? Maybe maybe you're very uh, liberal. And you probably are. If you're listening to Be The Talk podcast, you listen to TED Talks, most people who give a TED Talk or, you know, listen to them are probably Democratic or, you know, the Bernie Sanders type or what, you know, anything left of center. And that's great. You know, I welcome everybody. But, you know, if, if you're like me and you may not be like me, you know, if you hear too much of a certain angle and it just gets more and more, uh, kind of comical a little bit maybe or egregious or just more and more and, and it's like what's the other side believe okay what's the other side doesn't mean i'm going to believe that but i just want to know because i feel like i'm just being you know told what to think 
and something about me really doesn't like that from a, from a young age. So anyway, probably shouldn't have gone in that direction, but uh, let's just move on. So Nalini, Nalini and, and Nalini, if I'm not saying your name, I read a comment that somebody read, um, and, and so many people in her community, they were sharing and sharing and sharing. So her talk, uh, her Facebook Live uh, that we did is over, I believe, 850 views. Which is, you know, really, really exceptional. Also, just like, uh, just like um, Willems. Uh, so, really engaged community. And there was a there was a comment, and it said, "Hey, is he saying your first name correctly?" So, Nalini or Nalini or, or please, just and, and if if you're watching this and you come on, be the talk. You need to let me know, you know, the pronunciation <laughs> of your name and uh, and all of that. So, I'm going to just put my little apology there. Um, and I, but I know I got the last name uh, correctly because I, I practiced it and, and I was educated ahead of time. All right, before that, we're, we're going to just move on here. Uh, before that, we had Bill Roach, and uh, what a fun talk that was because he uh, he's all into entrepreneurship, and he is helping young people be able to scale and grow businesses. It's just amazing what he is doing, and he had a really fun talk that we we got a little bit more of the backstory on uh, from his TEDx talk about how he went into a school, a classroom full of, uh, I, I think they were junior high or elementary or maybe senior high. I don't, I don't remember the age group, but uh, but they weren't convinced. And he convinced the decision maker, the most stubborn kid in the class, that he was going to empower them to make his own decisions and just you know learn how to engage with customers, do all the stuff that adults are learning how to do and growing their companies. I mean, and, and he's doing this for kids in grade school. And it was just amazing. And so we talked about, you know, what does this do, not just for the street smart, determined kids that, that aren't overachievers in school because they, you know, they're into other things maybe, but what does this do for the book smart kids? This is great for the book smart kids, what he's doing, because it gets them out of their books. It gets them validating theories and interacting with customers and having to pivot and be flexible instead of just memorizing and becoming book smart and then having the rude awakening when they graduate from college like we all have, okay? How cool was that? It was just a great interview. Uh, Love talking with Bill about that. Before that, Doreen Lorenzo, who is an assistant assistant or associate, I'm sorry, uh, either one, um, one one of the two, assistant dean of, uh, of the design school at the University of Texas at Austin. We talked about design theory. We talked about, you know, validation, and we talked about all these things. We talked about a lot of the same, you know, educational thing about how do you break students who are rigidly learning how to uh, be tested to teach for the test and to learn for the test and instead be good learners and, and, and apply that and everything becomes applied and, and just taking things out of the classroom and really putting them in real life scenarios. Very similar to my talk with Bill and also similar to my talk with Peter Lynch, who I opened up with, as well as my design conversation with Paul uh, Sandeep. Uh, Paul Sandeep gave a TEDx uh, Hewlett Packard Bangalore talk, and he's a product designer. And so he's designed all these breakthrough products like a power cord that doesn't automatically fall out of the wall. When, when the wall plug, have you ever been in that situation at Starbucks or Panera Bread or wherever you go to be a Wi-Fi hobo like me, and I plug in, and then the thing is so loose that it just falls right out? Paul's the guy that solved the problem. He's developed other products uh, just like that. We talked a little bit about his process and his value system and how he's been able to do that. And then we talked before that to Peter Lynch, who is uh, his talk was called The Cul-de-Sac Startup, and it's all about uh, really overcoming, uh, this is my take on it, overcoming ageism. Uh, it's about finding new models that allow people that, that are in cul-de-sacs in suburbs uh, to really learn how to experiment, to play, to uh, find the margins in their life so that they can have the breakthrough instead of just being, you know, just being resigned to having to be an employee or whatever. He's finding new models to help people break out of that and finding new models to help people be able to carve out the time and a mechanism to be able to break through on uh, business ideas. And uh, it's just a great 
stuff that he is doing. Now, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, I'll say it this way. Fortunately, I have a Facebook Live with Peter. Um, it is just me on the screen because I didn't have the split screen because it's been a couple weeks since I did it, and I wasn't able to find out, you know, remember how to do that. So you'll still have the interview. You'll still have the audio, uh, but it's just me on the screen with Peter. Hey, everybody, uh, thank you so much. Um, for all of this, thank you, uh, those of you on LinkedIn that are sharing, that are uh, viewing on LinkedIn. Um, my preview video that I did a few days ago where I basically said uh, uh, the preview version of all 15 people on LinkedIn, uh, about uh, just under 3,500 views, which is new territory. I mean, I'd, I'd like to be able to say, oh, that was no big deal, and yeah, thank you for doing it. It's so great. We're holding steady. No, that was that was a real step up for all of us uh, this week, and, and it was uh, – just wonderful. I have, I'm starting to develop theories of LinkedIn versus uh, Facebook and, you know, who's throttling and all that. But, I mean, really going nuts on LinkedIn uh, as well uh, with, with all of that. So, anyhow, um, and, and I'll just say this. Um, the more I do this, the more I get little comments and pings, and I welcome them. You know, so if you know somebody that's given a great talk, a great branded talk, um, you know, uh, send them to our website. I mean, you can, you can have them apply at our websites, bethetalk.com, and then there's an FAQ page that also has an application. And uh, first and foremost, on the application, they need to put a link to their talk. And this is not going to be a traditional talk. It's not a keynote. It's not a Toastmaster. It's not, you know, a, a speech or a whatever. It has to be a specific TED talk, a TEDx talk, a Google Talks at Google Headquarters, Idea City, or Q Ideas. Those are the big five. Uh, and branded talks are talks that exalt the idea above the person who is speaking, and they have a very certain type of format. Uh, there are all kinds of podcasts uh, for Toastmasters and for you know speaking in general. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of podcasts, but what makes this Be The Talk unique is it's the world's only seven-day-a-week podcast that give you the tips, tools, and techniques to use to change the world through your branded talk, which is largely, it really is largely, TEDx is the big gorilla in the room in terms of proportion with over 100,000 alumni, uh, such as myself and the 100, and actually I am booked, uh, I have about at this point about 210 people who have either given an interview or will be giving an interview that, that have time on my schedule, and I'm rapidly closing out uh, to the end of 2018 right now. So uh, while you can, if you know somebody that, that um, wants to publicize and talk about the backstory of their TEDx talk or their branded talk as I am defining it, you know, feel free to send them that way. And uh, there's an application link live now on that website. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, watching these, spreading these, helping us promote these amazing speakers and guests, and everybody have a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. Let's remember those who uh, who not just served, but who who paid the ultimate uh, price for the service, especially here in the United States. Take care.